together. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement from the choir, and we pray that you order our steps in Jesus' name. Amen. In this marriage journey that we are going into, order our steps so that the outcome can be one of fulfillment and joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us to see your plan and purpose for marriage. Mm -hmm. And as many as are not yet married, we pray that these messages will help them to get into a proper, fulfilling, joyful marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those who have married, and maybe there are challenges in the marriage. As we look into principles in marriage and they begin to make the necessary corrections, oh Lord, we pray that in your mercy, and your grace will visit them and turn things around in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you've answered. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, we are looking at the message, Effective Preparation for Marriage, Part 1. Next week, we'll be looking at the Part 2. And what I want to do is to look at Genesis chapter 2, because if you want to understand the mind of God, you need to go back to when God first of all instituted that thing, what was in his mind, what was his objective, what was his goal. And we're going to see it in this particular passage to see those who want to get married, those who are still single, how do they prepare themselves for marriage? Marriage is one of the most important things in any person's life. Marriage can either break your life or make your life. Marriage can either enhance your life or it can mar that life. So you want to uh, really prepare because you're going to be in marriage for a long time to come. You get married at 26, you die at 86, you're going to be 60 years in that marriage. So it's not something to just go in without thinking, without preparing. Because once you make your choice, it's over. So you want to make the right choice. So it's a decision that we need to take with care and with seriousness. Marriage is a serious business and we need to adequately prepare before we get into it so that we can make it a great success. There is no point in getting into marriage and then it's a mess. No, God wants a marriage to be great. God wants it to be a great success, but the success is going to be depends on the preparation you give to it. A strong foundation will sustain a building. A weak foundation will result in that building collapsing. That's why we are talking about preparation. If you lay a solid foundation, it will sustain the marriage and things will work. If you lay a weak foundation, eventually the whole structure will collapse. So it's important, this preparation for marriage. And today I'm looking at three different things, part of this preparation. Sometimes some of the things I'm going to be saying may not be the things you want to hear, you know, because some people think that when we talk about marriage, we're talking about how a boy meets a girl and then they say, I do. It's more than that. That's not where it starts. Genesis chapter 2, go with me in verse 18. As we start this message, Genesis chapter 2 in verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. At this particular time, Adam did not even know he needed a wife. The Garden of Eden was so perfect, the animals were so perfect, the environment was so perfect, 
that Adam didn't even think about marriage. He didn't even know. It was God that said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him an help suitable for him. God said it then, and God is still saying so today. It is not good for man to be alone. Some people get married and say, it was better for me to be alone. No, it's not. It's not. It's because that marriage is not working. And it may be because you didn't do the proper preparation before you got into it. God says, it is not good for man to be alone. But I want to take him to the good place. And I will do that by making for him an help meet for him. And if God says it's not good for man to be alone, it is not good for man to be alone. Marriage is profitable, but we need to do it his way. So from this passage I have read, the first thing you see here is that marriage is God's idea. Marriage was not a human proposition. Marriage is God's institution. In fact, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus referred to it later. Let's see Matthew chapter 19 in verse 3. Many, many, I mean, centuries later, Jesus talking about what we have just read in Genesis chapter 2. This was what he said. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. He didn't make them male and females. He didn't make them males and female. He didn't make them males and females. It was one man, one woman, one Eve, one Adam. Do you know that all the perversions that man has introduced was not part of God's agenda? Polygamy. One man marrying two wives or many wives. It was not part of God's agenda. Adam, Eve. One man, one woman. Polyandry. One woman marrying many wives and many husbands. It was not in God's agenda. Do you realize that God made no provision for divorce? If the marriage of Adam and Eve did not work, that was the end. There's no other woman to marry. There's no other man to marry. That's the end. Because divorce was not part of God's program. God expected that marriage to work. And God expects your marriage to work. Amen. Get married. They are saying, in case it doesn't work, we are making preparation. What I'm going to do? Already, that marriage has failed even before you start, because your mentality is a mentality of failure. You are already preparing for failure. God did not expect that this marriage will not work. God expected it to work. So God made no provision for divorce, no provision for the marriage. It was one man, one woman. God expected that that marriage will work and it will be fruitful and fulfilling. So you should operate from God's perspective, from God's mind. So Jesus told these people and said, you're asking me a question. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain, the two of them shall be one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twin, but one flesh. Two becomes one. There's a unity. Unity of purpose. Unity of life. Unity of mind. Unity in everything. And the Bible says, what therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. What God has joined together, let not the woman put asunder. Where God has joined together, let not the man put asunder. What God has joined together, 
not the father, let not the father-in-law put asunder. What God has joined together, don't let the mother-in-law put asunder. What God has joined together, don't let friends put asunder. Divorce was never part of God's original idea. And Jesus was telling these people, you need to remember that they came to ask him a question about divorce. Should a man put away his wife for every cause? And Christ said, don't you understand God's agenda? What God has joined together, let no man put us on that. So that your question is irrelevant. It is not in line with God's program. I pray that as we go on in this series, we'll be discovering God's mind and we'll work our marriage at God according to God's idea and plan. That's the only way it can work. He was the one that created, I mean, that instituted marriage. It was God's idea. So number one, marriage is God's idea. It was not a human proposition. Marriage is God's institution. Because of that, to get the best from God, you must belong to God. Marriage is his idea. He's the only one that can give you the wisdom to know how to get the best out of your marriage. He's the only one that can help you and empower you to have a fulfilling marriage, to make sure that the institution he created is functioning in your life. But if you don't belong to that God, you can't get the best from him. To get the best from your marriage, you must belong to God. This therefore raises the issue of our relationship with God. So that's where I start. We're talking about marriage, but I'm talking about relationship with the Father. Somebody says, but I, I, I believe God. God created me. Yes, God created you. You belong to God by creation, but you need to read, there was a fall. Adam and Eve, they fell from holiness, from righteousness, they fell into sin, deceived by Satan. And from that moment, they, they were sinful in nature and all their offerings, all their offsprings became sinful because it was only after the fall that Cain, Abel, Sheth, they were born. So the sinful nature, perpetrated and was perpetrated within that. So we belong to God by creation. Yes, but you also need to belong to God by redemption. You need to be a child of God. You need to be born again. You need to belong to the Father. And how do you belong to God by redemption? Proverbs chapter 28, in verse 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13. There is a pathway to reconciliation with God. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins cannot prosper. If you don't acknowledge your sin, if you don't repent of the sin, there is no mercy. There is no relationship with God. But the Bible says, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh dead shall have mercy. If you will confess your sins, if you will forsake the sins, the Lord will have mercy upon you. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, let him forsake his thoughts. That's the first thing. But that's not sufficient. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And let him return to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There is pardon at Calvary for the repentant sinner that confesses his sins, that forsakes the sins and turns to the Lord and comes back home. Like the prodigal son that has gone into the far country, repents, comes back home, 
then the father will accept him. And that's the way back to the father. Relationship with God starts with forgiveness and pardon. Relationship with God starts with cleansing and renewal. Your sins must be forgiven. And the Bible says, when you come to him, 1 John chapter, chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, this is what God will do when you abandon your sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is, the Lord will have mercy. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If you say you are a believer, but your life is contrary, the Bible says you are lying. You are not doing the truth. You say you are a believer and you are single, but from time to time, fornication, immorality in your life. I say, but God understands. It's just that I have this pressure in the body. You lie. You do not the truth. You are a sinner. You need to repent of that fornication, of the adultery, of the morality, of the masturbation. Maybe you get pregnant, you are bought. You need to repent. Now, in verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, you can't walk in darkness and say you belong to God. Christ is in the light. And if you say you belong to Christ, you need to walk in the light. And it's only that time you can have fellowship with us. It says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. You can be cleansed from every form of defilement. But there is a necessity of abandoning darkness and coming into the light. There is a necessity of repenting of your sin, confessing and forsaking them, and returning unto the Lord. There is a necessity of the wicked forsaking his ways and the unrighteous man for, for forsaking his thoughts, and then he returns unto the Lord before there will be that mercy. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, there are some people that say, well, I was born innocent and since I was born, I have remained innocent. I never sinned. I'm not a sinner. I'm morally okay. The Bible says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. The truth is not in you. In verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 7 tells you, cleanse us from, cleanse us from all sin. Verse 9 tells you, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the extent of the efficacy of the redemption that Jesus gave, I mean, provided for us at Calvary. Cleansing from all sin. Somebody who has aborted, cleansing from all sin. Somebody who has murdered before, cleansing from all sin. Somebody who has stolen before, cleansing from all sin. Somebody who has been in prostitution before, cleansing from all sin and all unrighteousness. Now, this is an opportunity. This is how to make it right with God. Relationship with God starts with forgiveness, starts with pardon, starts with cleansing, and starts with renewal. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I read from verse 11. And I'm asking you, has the grace of God appeared unto you? Ah, somebody says, Pastor, I thank God for the grace of God in my life. And I say, you, you are still living in cohabitation and still doing boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, grace of God in your life. I don't think so. Say, ah, don't say to God, his, his, his grace is so much upon me. 
Let's see what God's grace does when it comes into your life. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. When grace comes into your life, it brings salvation. When grace appears unto all men, it brings salvation. And what will that salvation do? Verse 2, verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, the grace of God will teach you that you cannot continue in sin so that grace may abound. God forbid. Grace tells you that I cannot be where corruption is. I cannot be where defilement is. I cannot be where pollution is continuing. No. Grace teaches you that you must deny ungodliness. You must deny worldly loss. And what should you do? Grace said, I came so that you can live soberly. I came to empower you for righteous living. I came so that you can be godly. Not when you get to heaven. Where? In this present yeah, world. Next. In this present world. You know, there are some people say, when we get to heaven, we'll be holy. No, God expects you to be holy here. And grace is available for you to be holy. Grace says, I came so that sin can come out of your life and righteousness can reign in your life. That's why I came. So you find somebody that said, in fact, you know, I'm enjoying the grace of God. You enjoying the grace of God. Drunk from time to time. Campari is your friend. Vino is your buddy. And you are telling me you are born again. Which born again? Not the born again from the Bible. That one is born again from your pocket. Grace has not told you that you need to deny ungodliness and worldly loss. You have not tasted the grace of God. What you have is what we call fake grace. Fake. It's fake. You know when somebody has some money and it's, it's money, but it's fake money. What can you buy with fake money? When they catch you with fake money, what happens? They arrest the person. When, when, when they find you with fake grace, you're in danger. And there are some people, the grace they say, they claim to have experienced is fake grace. You need to experience true grace. And the true grace that you experience will teach you to deny ungodliness, will teach you to get away from worldly loss. And that grace will empower you for sober, righteous living, empower you for godly living in this present world. Very important. Look at verse 14. He's talking about Jesus who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how many iniquity? All, All iniquity. iniquities. How many years ago there was somebody that used to come to church and the person before we met her she was doing prostitution so eventually we evangelized she started coming to church. And as she was coming to church, from time to time, I will call her, sister, how is your life now? Have you fully given your life to Christ and you are following God? And she will say, God is helping me. One time I was interviewing her and said, Pastor, you know what? I don't go to the joint anymore. No, 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 no. I don't go to the road anymore. I don't they walk for road anymore. I just stay at home. But I still have some Italians that visit me, but in my house. I encourage her. We thank God for what God is doing. You are making progress, but you are not there yet. That one is still prostitution. Prostitution is not only the ones that stand on the road. If Italians are still visiting you in your house and paying you money for your body, it's still prostitution. Maybe we call that one house prostitution. We call the other one road prostitution. But prostitution is prostitution of, irrespective of the, of the label we put on it. She kept on coming to church. She kept on coming to church. 
hearing the word of God. One time, as she said, Pastor, you know what you told me the other time? I really thought about it and I've been praying. God has helped me. I said, I will thank God. So, what is the next story? I said, Pastor, all those Italians, I don't see them anymore. Only one remain. I see only one. All the others. I said, We thank God. You are making progress. From every Dick and Harry on the road to only some selected few in the house. From selected few in the house, it remained only one. I said, It's still prostitution. My sister, you have not fully come out. And we thank God that person started, kept on coming to church until eventually she left prostitution, finally washed her hands, became completely born again, and went on <coughs> in her life. That's what we are talking about. Have you read this passage in verse 14? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, not some, not most of the iniquity, all iniquity. My brother, you need to come out and come out right. You have been pushing drug. You need to come out right, out. Say, Pastor, I used to push cocaine and push, uh, you know, and, and, and heroin. But now, I only sell small, small marijuana. My brother, you are still a sinner. You are still a drug pusher. We need to come out. It redeems us from all iniquity. Everything must go. That's why the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It must be total. Christianity is a radical change. It's a total makeup. Total change. And it can redeem you from all iniquity, no matter what it is. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's the essence of salvation. God saves you from all iniquity. He cleanses you. He renews you. And then, you know, makes you a peculiar person, zealous of good works. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, there's nothing you can do to earn salvation, irrespective of how it is. Punishing yourself does not buy you salvation. Penance does not buy you sal salvation. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Salvation is by grace. And what does he do? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And this afternoon I'm asking you, have you been renewed by the Holy Ghost? Or are you still deep in sin, defiled? Or have you been cleansed and renewed? Renewal of the Holy Ghost. The washing of the regeneration, cleansing. That's how we get born again. That's how we belong to, to, to God. We come out of darkness into the light. We come out of defilement and we are cleansed. We come out of worldly loss and now we can live soberly, righteously in the world. That's what it means to be born again. And if that's what it means to have a relationship with the Father. And if you don't have that, you are not born again. But thank God, on the platform today, you can be born again. God is in the business of helping his sons and daughters. We're talking about marriage. I told you, marriage is God's idea. If you want to be helped into a good marriage, you need to belong to God. Because God is only interested in helping his children to get properly married, get properly settled. God is in the business of helping his sons and daughters. And the question I'm asking you today is, are you his son? Are you his daughter? If you call God your father, can he respond and say, yes, I am your father, my daughter, what do you want? My son, what do you want? Or is he going to tell you, I never knew you, you that work iniquity, depart from me. 
What will be God's answer if you call him father? There are people that call God father and God rejects that and say, I'm not your father, I don't know you. Depart from me, you that walk in iniquity, I don't know you from anywhere. What is going to be God's response? You want God to call you father? Look at what he said. Second Corinthians chapter six. If you want God to call you father, this is what you need to do. Otherwise, he cannot call you father. I mean, he cannot call you daughter. He cannot call you son. If you want God to call you son or call you daughter, this is what you need to do. Second Corinthians chapter six from verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship at righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion at light with darkness? And what concord at Christ with Belial? Or what part at it that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement at the temple of God with idols? I want to see those five adjectives that are used in that place. The first thing is unequal yoke. I mean, the first thing, fellowship. The next one, communion. The next one, concord. The next one, partnership. The last one, agreement. And there are questions. What fellowship at righteousness with unrighteousness? There should be none. What communion as light with darkness? There is none. If your house is dark, when you switch on the light, what happens to darkness? It disappears. It disappears. If we switch off the light and light disappears, what happens? Darkness, darkness appears. Darkness and light, they don't, they don't fellowship, they don't mix. If you switch on the light, darkness will go away. If we switch off the light, darkness will come. So he says here, what communion at light with darkness? There is none. What concord at Christ with Satan? There is none. What partnership at it that believeth with an infidel? There is none. And what agreement at the temple of God with idols? You worship God in the temple of God. You don't bring an idol into the temple of God. There is no agreement. Five things. And God is saying, look at your life as a believer. Are you having fellowship with unbelievers? As somebody that says you are in the light, are you having communion with darkness? As somebody who says you belong to Christ, do you have concord with Satan? You are a member of a cult, no matter what the cult, a body cult, reformed the body fraternity, the lodge, Freemason, all these are cults. You say you belong to Christ, but you are still a member of a cult. And the Bible says, what partnership are they that believe with an infidel? There is none. And what agreement are the temple of God with idols? You say you are worshiping God, but you are still worshiping the, you know, the idol of your family. When it is the festival time, you send money because they need to buy the materials. Are you a Christian? I want to go say, verse 17, verse 16. I want agreement at the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So, what then are we to do? Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. If you want God to receive you and to have fellowship with God, that's what you need to do. Say, come out from all these dirty things. Come out from all these damaging relationships. You know, unbeliever and believer. Come out from defilement. Come out from idolatry. Come out from worshiping Satan. Come out from, you know, all sorts of darkness. God says, come out from among them and be ye separate. And touch not the unclean thing. Who go back? And I will receive you. Verse 18. And will be a father unto you, 
and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord. That's the condition. That's the condition. That when you call God and say, Father, he says, yes, daughter, I'm here, I'm listening. What have you to say? When you call God and say, Father, I'm coming, say, my son, what do you need? For God to respond to you as a son or as a daughter, this is the criteria. God says, come out from among them, be separate. Don't touch the unclean thing. Then I can be a father unto you, and you can be my sons and daughters. Check your own life. Do you meet this criteria? Do you have a relationship with the father? Are you a true believer? Or are you just a church goer? A deeper life member without salvation. Being a deeper life member does not take you to heaven. What takes you to heaven is being saved. And this is what we are talking about. We can have your record in the membership, but if you are sinning, you won't make heaven. Because you are not going to find deeper life in heaven. You are going to find Christians in heaven. People who lived for God. Deeper life is a vehicle to help you to get to heaven. It's not your passport to heaven. Salvation is your passport to heaven. Have you believed? Have you repented? Have you confessed your sins? Have you forsaken them? Have you returned unto the Lord? Have you asked him for forgiveness and cleansing? Are you a child of God? So number one, if you are going to prepare well for marriage, knowing that marriage is God's idea, is the only one that can make you to really implement that marriage in a very successful and fulfilling manner. God can only help you if you have a relationship with him. Relationship with the father, that's where the story starts. And I'm asking you today, are you born again? Are you a child of God? Are you still toying with sin? You are single, but fornication is just a part of your life. Or maybe you're on the platform, you are married, but adultery, relationship, extramarital relationship is your business. And God is calling you today. And you say, well, I don't know, my, my wife is not understanding me. My marriage is not working. That marriage cannot work. God cannot help you in that kind of a messy state. You need to repent. And then God can see how to help you adjust your marriage and from the series we are going to be, to, to be going through, you'll be able to get a lot of insight into how to manage your family so that you have fulfillment. Because God has given us all that we need to make that marriage to work if we, if we listen to them. So number one, relationship with the father. So if you want to get married, you are preparing for marriage, that's the first thing, to be born again, properly born again. If you are living with somebody and you are cohabiting, boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, you need to leave that. Say, we are going to get married. And we don't carry fornication and turn it into marriage. No. Marriage should be on the platform of righteousness. Number two, preparation for marriage. So the first preparation is having a relationship with the father. The second re pre preparation, responsibility and faithfulness. And I'm asking you, are you responsible? And I'm asking you, are you faithful? You need to understand that marriage is not for boys and girls. Marriage is for men and women. People that are responsible adults. You are in your parents' house, they are still feeding you. They are still paying your school fees. You are not an adult. Adulthood calls for independence. Somebody is still feeding you and still housing you. You are not independent. Marriage is not for boys and girls. Marriage is for responsible men and women. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him 
into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Adam was not just to wake up in the morning, eat, luxuriate around, sleep, and then wake up the following morning. He had a job, he had an assignment. And God says, this environment we have given you, dress it, keep it, keep it neat, keep it in a very good way. You find some men where you are, the whole place is dirty. You drink Coca-Cola, you throw it there. You have just finished pizza, you throw the other one. All your environment is dirty and stinking, you know, it's this one here, that one here, that one here, disorganized environment. You say, Pastor, I'm praying for wife. You are not ready. Before wife came, did you see what God told Adam? Dress, eat, and keep it. Your environment needs to be neat. You are responsible for your environment. A disorganized environment, a dirty environment, is an indication that whoever is living in that place, you are not responsible. I'm married. And the next thing is not married. The next thing is, the first thing is, you know, to get things in shape. This was like a job also for Adam. Because that's, if today Adam was doing this kind of a thing, this is what we call horticulture. Dressing and keeping gardens, horticulture. That would have been the profession today. Adam had a job. Adam had an assignment. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. die. God gave him commandments to keep. And Adam was meant to be obedient, to be faithful. As a man, you can't keep rules. You live in a community where they say that these are, these are the rules of engagement in this community. Hey, I, I can live the way I like. It's my life now. How are you going to just put all that? And you want to get married. You are not ready. As a sister, you are living in a place and say, sister, you know, the rule over here is when you finish your food, we don't want the sink to be dirty, please. You wash your plates and you put it there. That's the way we live in this community. Once you finish your food, wash your plates, put it there. Not that you will stack it up until the evening because we are many living here. We don't want flies. And that's not the way my mother taught me. And that's not the way I live. And I will do things my own way. My sister, you are not ready for marriage. That's a training ground for you. God gave the man boundaries not to cross. And God said, you can eat of every tree, but that tree, no touching. That's your boundary. And it was meant to be obedient. It was meant to be faithful. If you cannot be responsible and you cannot be faithful, you are not ready for marriage. Do you know it was after that that God now said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him an help me. But you know what I see today? Many people that are not responsible, many people that are not faithful, they are looking to get married. That marriage will break. That marriage cannot function. It won't. Because all the deficiencies in your life that made you to be irresponsible and unfaithful, is going to mar that marriage. In the marriage, you'll be irresponsible. In the marriage, you'll be unfaithful. And at the end of the day, that marriage is going to scatter. Thou shalt not commit fornication. Somebody says, ah, that one is too hard for me now. God understands. That's why when you get married also, you'll be having extramarital affairs. Because 
You don't live within boundaries. God says, as a single individual, sex is out of bounds. Say, no, 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 no. I cannot agree with that. Even when you marry. And God says, now that you are married, sex is only within the context of my, ah, no, how am I going to be in bondage? That's what it's going to be. The unfaithfulness that you carry into the marriage will undermine the marriage. The irresponsibility you carry into the marriage will undermine the marriage. That's why it will not work. So this is where you start to be responsible, to be faithful. A brother that is single, never did boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, never did any morality, kept himself. When he gets married, it's easy for him to keep to his wife and not be lured by anybody. It's easy. Because that same responsibility and faithfulness will carry on into the marriage. He was faithful and chaste before he got married. He will be faithful and chaste now that he is married. He was responsible before he got married. Now he will be responsible after he, he gets married. Very important. Responsibility and faithfulness. One of the indices of responsibility is faithfulness and obedience to God's commandments. God gave Adam a commandment to observe. And you know, for those who are single, the Bible says, flee fornication. Faithfulness to that is important if you want God to help you to get into good marriage. Thou shall not commit adultery. That's a boundary. If you, are, if you are married and your marriage is not working and you want God to help you in that marriage, faithfulness to that commandment. You know, people are, 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 are have you, can you look up? Somebody has a saw. The saw is already, you know, bringing out paws and we want to treat it. And the person said, no, 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 I don't want, just put plaster. A saw that pore is already coming out, pore is already coming out of it. And then you cover it with plaster. Say, pastor will heal it. Will he heal? No, sir. Is that the place to start? No, sir. How do we start? Clean. Clean, clean it. it. You, clean clean, it. You, you clean the mess first. You remove the pores. You disinfect the wound. Then when you put plaster, the wound can heal. The same way. Some people, marriage, marriage, marriage. That's not where to start. Responsibility, faithfulness. If you don't sort that out, forget about a good marriage. You are, you are joking. Forget about it. We need to remove the pores from the soil. We need to disinfect the wound. Then when we now put plaster, the wound will heal. We need to make sure that we remove the irresponsibility in that life. We remove the unfaithfulness in that life. Then when we go ahead for marriage, that marriage will work. So one of the indices of responsibility is faithfulness and obedience to God's commandments. God gave Adam a commandment to observe. And God has given you as a single individual many commandments to observe. Do you? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. How often are you regular in fellowship? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Do you keep that commandment? Flee fornication. Do you keep that commandment? You are the temple of the living God. You should not join yourself to an harlot. Do you keep that commandment? And I say, uh, Pastor, you know, once I get married, all this problem will solve. If the problem will solve because of marriage, David should not be going after Bathsheba. He had more than one wife. Marriage doesn't solve that problem. If marriage solves that problem, after 1,000 women, Solomon should not be going for another one. 
And people are thinking, and when I get married, it will stop. It's not going to stop. It's part of you. You need to stop it before marriage. You need to be faithful before you get into marriage. Otherwise, that unfaithfulness will carry over into the marriage. You will be unfaithful in the marriage. It's normal. And I'm asking you the question, are you willing and are you obedient to God's commandments? You know what the Bible says? If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If you are willing and obedient, you'll be able to eventually go ahead and enter into a profitable, fulfilling, you know, joyful marriage. But it's important. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. So the next thing is responsibility and faithfulness. Adam was responsible. Adam was faithful. And because of that, he was ready for marriage. Isaiah chapter 1, in verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. What happens if you are not willing and obedient? Verse 20. But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Willingness and obedience to God's instructions and to God's commandments, you end up in a good place. Rebellion and disobedience and refusal to heed God's instructions, you end up in a bad place. Your decision determines your destiny. Very important. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Maybe there is a way you have been living your life, but God is giving you an advice today. He's telling you how to live. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus said the Lord, stand ye in the ways. And today you are standing in the ways. Amen. And, see, Amen. and ask for the old parts. And what we are giving you, what we are preaching to you is the old path. Amen. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And you shall find the rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Even if we are told about the old path, even if we know about the old path, even when we have discovered the old path, we will not walk therein. We will not have rest. The word God says, ask, then walk in the, in, the, in the old path, then you will find rest for your soul. I will not walk therein. And there is no rest. There is no fulfillment. That's the way it goes. Responsibility and faithfulness. Another index of responsibility is gain full employment and independence. Adam was gainfully employed as an horticulturist, an horticulturist in the Garden of Eden. Adam had a place he could call his personal home. When God comes to visit Adam, Adam had a place that was his own in the Garden of Eden. My brother, you want to get married. Where you live, you have about five men living in a two-bedroom apartment. Somebody sleeps in the living room. Two share one room, two share another room. They are all five, you know, moving like that. And then you say, I'm going to get married. Where are you bringing the woman? They say, Pastor, here, here, they're not ready for marriage. You need a place you can call your own. 
a woman is entitled to her privacy. That woman is entitled to her privacy. Adam had a house of his own. He's independent. So I'm asking you, are you gainfully employed? And are you independent? My brother, you stand near the train station or near a particular place and you are carrying a can all day. And if people pity you, they put 50 cents, they put 10 cents. At the end of the day, when you count it, it's one euro 20 you have collected. Is that the way you are going to keep a family? Where is the money to pay the rent? Where is the money to, you know, to feed the family? When the children begin to come, Oh, children drink a lot of milk and they need a lot of pampas. Where is the money? Say, Pastor, God will provide. My brother, you are not ready for marriage. You are not ready for marriage. You are not gainfully employed. You are not independent. You need this for marriage to work. Some people marry in that situation. And then they bring the sister home. And now men that love food in the house where you are, you now say, I live in one room with my wife. Uh, two other tenants live in the other room. And one is in the no privacy, not, not only that, all the men will now say, a sister, you know, I, I like Sebo a lot. And then she becomes a slave to everybody. In the, she's the one that is cooking for this and cooking for that. You didn't marry her to be a slave. She's not a community servant. That woman is entitled to a privacy and her life. You need a place of your own. You say, my parents have given me a house within their house. And then she becomes the, the, the family. No. Next week, you will hear more about that. When we talk about cleaving and living, I mean, living and cleaving, you will hear more about that. So my brother, if you are not gainfully employed and you are not independent, you are not ready for marriage. You need to sort that out first. Be gainfully employed, be independent. If the woman comes and says, hey, I want to cook vegetable soup, say, I don't have pot to. Say, how are you be eating? I just eat biscuit and go. Is the woman going to be eating biscuit and go? You don't have pot, you don't have this, you don't have this. Oh, we're talking about settling down in a home. My brother, you are, not, you, are, you, are not, you are not ready for marriage. Say, Pastor, I'm 38. It's not being 38 that makes you to be ready for marriage. If you are still living the way I've said, even you may be 42, you are not ready for marriage. Gainful employment and independence is important. Otherwise, that marriage will not work. The tension that finances will bring will make the marriage to collapse. All the kind of stress she's going to encounter as a result of you not being independent is going to make that marriage to collapse. When your father-in-law comes and says, okay, do this one. The mother-in-law comes and says, ah, I thought you are a wife in this house. Why is all the compound getting? And she becomes a slave to everybody in the family. Tension every time, stress. And then you say the marriage is not working. Of course it's not working because you are not independent living in your father's house. Get out, go and rent your own house, be independent. Let the woman have a space in which she can grow, a space in which she can be herself. An entitlement to her privacy, that's part of preparation for marriage. I can see one brother that I say, Pastor, you are blowing my heart too. I thought that you are just going to come and say, ah, we find that CC, oh, me. <laughs> For me to tell you how you will find this is is that the first thing? That's not the first thing. When you get CC, what are you going to use to feed CC? What are you going to use to pay for the rent? You don't have that, but you want CC. My brother, you better settle down. You are hearing stuff today. Amen. 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 Preparation for marriage. Responsibility 
faithfulness, gainful employment, independence. Even for the sisters also, independence. The husband has grown in one way, you have grown in another way, you've grown in two different environments with two different mentalities. When you first of all start marriage, you are now going to be integrating those mentalities, integrating your outlook and, well, a square peg does not easily fit into a round hole. There will be some rough edges. And when those rough edges come, it's part of it. You are trying to, you know, to put things together so that they can work. But any little thing, you phone your mom. Any little thing, you phone your dad. And they're always putting their mouth into that marriage. They're not independent. When we talk about independence, physical independence, emotional independence, intellectual independence, you can make decisions by yourself without asking anybody. You have enough sense to be able to put two and two together and say, okay, I want to do this, this, this and that. You are educated and intelligent enough. You have grown as an adult. You are experienced enough to be able to make decisions. Complete independence. Otherwise, how you going to marry? You just live like a baby in the home. You just live like babies. So I'm talking about independence, not just physical independence in every way. You're emotionally independent from your parents. If you have a challenge, you don't have to call them. You can solve the problem in an amicable way, in a way that fosters progress. Independence. Either man the place you could call his personal home. My brother, do you have a place you can call your personal home? Without that, you're not ready for marriage. Are you gainfully employed and independent? If not, you are not ready for marriage. Somebody may be saying, ah, is this what pastor? Yes, this is what marriage is all about. Go back to Genesis chapter, chapter two. So number one, relationship with the father. Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Are you a son of God? Are you a daughter of God? Number two, are you somebody that is responsible? Somebody that is faithful? Are you gainfully employed? Are you independent physically, emotionally? Are you an adult, a responsible adult? You find some men, you know why? They've gone to work. The woman has been at home. The woman has cleaned everywhere. Everywhere is looking neat and cool. When the man comes, as he's coming home, he, he removes his suit. He throws it there. He removes the tie. Throws it there. He removes the shoe. Throws it there. Ten minutes after coming home, the living room is like a war zone. The woman is frustrated. This is what she has spent a lot of time to tidy, to make everywhere look presentable and go. The man comes back from work, 15 minutes after coming back from work, the whole living room is a mess. It's like a war zone. And the woman is frustrated. And when the woman tells her, what are you talking about? I went to work. She's also been working. And then you say, she's complaining. You know, it's because you are not a responsible man. How do you do that? When you come back, you go to the to, to the bedroom or whatever, you open the, 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 the something, your your coat, you hang it where it should be, your shoe, you put it where it should be, your tie, you hang it where it should be. That's responsibility. Not creating a lot of mess for no. Say I expect her to, to, to pack it. Why do you expect her to pack it? What stops you from putting it in the right place in the first place? It's part of irresponsibility. And, and, and there is a lot of all these attitudes in especially men that need to be corrected. Otherwise, you are going to create unnecessary stress in that marriage. When I go to the bathroom, 
My pajamas is folded complete from the bathroom. As I'm coming from the bathroom, the folded pajamas goes into where it should be. I'm not waiting for my wife to just drop the pajamas there on the bed, just like that, and she will tidy it up. What stops you from tidying it up? How long does it take to fold your pajamas and put it in the proper place? By the time you are coming out of the bathroom, the pajamas is folded, you just go to where it ought to be, it's there. Irresponsibility. So there are a lot of things to correct in our life because those things are going to cause a lot of tension and stress in the family. Habits. They are not sins, but they are habits that cause, you know, a lot of, and it's because of irresponsibility. And I'm praying that the Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, there are practical things we are going to be discussing, but we will not discuss it in church. We will discuss it in the forum. When we have singles forum, then we, we discuss practical things. When we have couples forum, we discuss practical things. Very, very important. Very, very important. Responsibility. Faithfulness. Faithfulness to God. Faithfulness to your employer. Faithfulness in the church. Faithfulness in the community. They put you in charge of counting, counting the offering. Nobody is there, or you don't steal. Faithfulness. It's part of preparation for marriage. When you see a brother that is stealing money from his wife's purse, he has been stealing church offering before he was married. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When a man has been stealing church offering, when they put him in charge of the church offering, when he gets married, eh, the church offering, that's a purse. The wife's purse, that's another purse. The attitude just continues. Faithfulness. Your wife can leave money in the purse and the money is not going to... And then when you... It's only me and you in this house. I put a thousand euros, say maybe it flew. My brother, <laughs> it's Euro aeroplane. Mm -hmm. How did it fly? <laughs> say, we need to pray over oh, all these strange happenings in this house. Maybe one demon. Which demon? You are the one that took the body. What demon? You have always been unfaithful. Now he's showing up and creating tension in that marriage. So responsibility and faithfulness, very, very important. Major preparations for marriage, if that marriage is going to work. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. For him. You know what? Marriage is a reward from the father. A gainfully employed Adam, a faithful Adam, an independent Adam, an Adam that has a relationship with the father. The father says, it is not good that this man will remain alone. Let me make an help meet for him. When you have fulfilled all these criteria, you have a relationship with the father. You behave like a responsible adult. You are faithful, obedient to divine instructions. You have a gainful employment. You are independent like Adam. God says, now you are ready to settle down. I will make an help meet for you. It's a reward from the father. Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. Verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife. What does he find? A good find thing. Find a good thing. Find it a good thing. And obtain it favor of, of, the the Lord. of the Lord. When you find a good woman, that's a favor from God. I found a good woman. 
I obtained favor from God. I'm forever grateful. Bible says, if you find a wife, you find a good thing and obtain the favor of the Lord. You need to go into marriage rights. Several years ago, one brother came to me, came to me with the wife for counseling. And he said, Pastor, uh, you know, this is my wife that you see. She's a devil. And I was telling the brother, how can your wife be a devil? He said, Pastor, you don't know my wife. I'm telling you, she's a devil. Your wife is meant to be a good thing, not a devil, not a bad thing. And I'm asking myself, how did they get into this marriage? And when the wife also is going to talk, he said, Pastor, this is my husband. She just looks like sheep. This one, he said, Pan incarnate. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a home is that going to be? It's going to be rat and cat, beating themselves all the time. Also, find it a wife, find it a good thing. My brother, I pray that <laughs> when eventually you find a wife, you will find a good thing. Amen. You will find something that will bless your life. Amen. You will find something that will bring you fulfillment. Amen. You will find something that when you look back, you say, God, I thank you for finding this woman in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So find it a wife, find it a good thing, and obtain it favor of the Lord. A good marriage is a reward from the Father. God will make sure that he shields you from people that will bring sorrow into your life, will bring frustration into your life. God will shield you. Say favor. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 14. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers. And a prudent wife it's is from, from the Lord. Lord. From the Lord. You know, many people, like I said last week, don't understand that passage very well. If they do, they will not do what they do. Your father can give you house because house are the inheritance of fathers. Your father can give you riches and increase your bank account because riches are the inheritance of fathers. But a prudent wife is only God that can give you that. And when your father says, we know that family, we know that girl is a good girl. I'm telling you, you marry her already, you are going into trap. A prudent wife is not from your father. A prudent wife is not from your mother. A prudent wife is not from the suggestion of your friends. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Lord. From the Lord. It's a reward from God. And you need to understand that. And the opposite also. A good husband, a godly husband is from the Lord. A sister God knows what you have gone through, how you have grown, the pains you have suffered. You know, life could be so lonely sometimes. God wants to give you a man that will appreciate you, a man that will love you, a man that will care for you, a man who is faithful and focused. You know, some people get married and the husband of the woman is also the husband of every lady in the community. And the woman is so ashamed because the husband is just sleeping with almost every woman in the community. And then she was looking at, and I married this man. How is she going to be happy? My sister, you don't want to marry community husband. Though. You want to marry your own husband. Amen. 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 If he's not faithful before he got married, he's not going to be faithful after he gets married. He will be, he will be messing around, flirting around. A prudent wife is from the Lord. A godly husband is from the Lord. So you need to understand that marriage a good marriage is a reward from the Father. 
reward for you being a son, for you being a daughter, reward for you being responsible, and for you being faithful, reward for following the course that God wants you to, call, to follow. And God says, I need to settle this, my son. You know what happens? You know what in the family? Let's assume that a father has two sons in the family. One, when the father says, can you help me to go and you know, stay in the office for one hour, I'll be out. You're dozing. The father says, okay, can you take that car? You know, take this, my, I want you to take these two of my workers to this place to go and work for me. He, he, he does it. Very obedient, very faithful. Then the other son said, that is not my business, it's your own. Why should I do that? You know, the day will come when the father will talk about he wants to set to the one that is very obedient. Is that not so? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And financially and otherwise, he will say to them. And the other one said, But I'm your son. Say, My son, you better get out of my out of my sight. You're a bastard. Say, about that, I'm not the bastard. And he's not saying that he didn't give back to him, but he's saying, I send you here, you complain. I tell you to do this one. Then who are you coming to, to ask for? For what? I don't have anything to give you. That's what the father is saying. The same way. You have a relationship with the father, you are responsible, you are faithful, then God says, I, I need to settle this, my son. I need to settle this, my daughter. I need to let her be in a relationship that she will enjoy and be fulfilled for the rest of her life. Marriage is a reward from the father. Be faithful in God's house. You are working, you are single today. God says, pay your tithe. You don't pay your tithe. And then you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, one of the good women in the church, God says, you, you are not faithful in my house, but you want me to be faithful to you. I can't. People don't understand that. Faithfulness in everything. When you earn your tithe, be faithful. God says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. It's not the money. God is looking whether you will be obedient. Faithfulness is important. Faithfulness to God's instructions, obedience to God's commandment is a foundation. Otherwise, it's not going to work. A good and fulfilling marriage is a reward from the Father. A good, godly, and submissive wife is from the Lord. God knows the heart of women. He knows the one that is going to be arrogant and, uh, you know, you can't speak to her, you can't, no dialogue. God knows. And if you are a child of God, God makes sure that he steers you clear of that. A faithful, focused, and sacrificial husband is also from the Lord. God knows, my sister, the man that is going to take care of you, Take, for example, when you talk about clothes. For every cloth that a man needs, a woman needs about three. My brother, if you have a suit, your wife needs about three dresses because of the nature of women. A woman can easily smell more than a man, you know, because of you know, their physiological constitution. So when money comes in the family, your wife is likely going to spend more money on clothes than you. But when you find a man that is not sacrificial, is the one, instead of him having one suit and the wife having three dresses, he tells the woman, I'm the one that is always going and representing this family. I need to have three suits. One dress should be enough for you. My sister. But God has a way of steering you away from that kind of a man. Very mean, not sacrificial that does not put your own interest at heart first. And I want to tell you that a faithful, a focused, a sacrificial husband is also from the Lord. It's not from the recommendation of people. It was God that gave Eve to Adam. God created Eve and brought her to Adam. It was God also that gave Adam to Eve. God is still the perfect matchmaker. If you match those two, they can match you with your 
with your partner. You know what people are doing today? Trying to get a wife or a husband through a lot of counsel somebody some years ago. His life was a complete mess. Very bad. When I finished, I asked him, but how did you meet this woman? I said, Pastor, I just went to Nigeria, all right. And then somebody said, can you see that sister in the church? Very good sister. She will take care of you. I said, based on that recommendation, that's why I approached her and said, I want to marry you. I don't know how. I have not prayed. And then my mother said, okay. If you see the terror, the man will sleep inside the car for the night. Otherwise, in the house, it's, it's going to be war. So just to have peace, the man will go outside and sleep in the car for the whole night. And the wife is okay. You are sleeping in the street. Don't come to this house. Terror. But that's how he met her. In the church. But somebody just said, you see that sister? Very sweet, very good. She will take care of you. And she took care of him very well. <laughs> But in the other way, <laughs> in the other way, I pray your marriage will not be like that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great marriages do not come from the computer algorithms of online dating agencies. That's where people are finding wife now and finding husband. They join a dating website and then they say you put all your characteristics inside it and put it there. And computer is matching one one to one. I pray that computer will not be matching you to somebody else. A dump machine, a dump machine is matching you to somebody else, and you expect it to work. Great marriages don't come from the computer algorithms of online dating agencies. Number two, fulfilling marriages do not come from the recommendations of human matchmakers, whoever they may be. They don't come from your parents telling you to marry, your friends telling you to marry, your colleagues telling you that man, ah, that man is the fact. No, you pray. A good marriage is from the Lord. Reward from the Father. Too many years ago, I was growing up, but I, I, I didn't want to get married very early. I came home one day and my mom said, uh, we have found one very nice girl for you. You know, the, she told me the family and go, I, I allowed her to land. So when she finished landing, I said, mama, there is freedom in Nigeria. If you bring any woman to my house, police, I call police to come and arrest her and and my mom knows that I could do that. That was the end of the story. That's how I could have married. And then my mom said, but I've not seen anybody. You said you are going to get married. I said, you, you be patient. When it's time to get married, you will be, uh, how? One year wait, two years wait. My mom called me one day and said, look, you are my first son. Mother to, mother to son talk. You know, mother and son talk. Tell me, are you impotent? That was all. But because she doesn't see any woman with me. I don't have any girlfriend. I'm not messing around. She knows. So it's like, how are you going to find a woman? I, say, I don't find a woman through immorality. When it is time, I will pray. God will show me my wife. Say, eh? say yes. And when it was time, I prayed. I didn't find the wife by dating. I didn't find the wife by trial and error. I prayed and God met me to my present wife. Pray, he's your father, he wants to give you the best. And when I told my mom, she almost fell out of the chair. Said, eh, you, 
You found a woman. Say, God gave me one. <laughs> and that's how I got married. My mom loves her so much. If, if my mom falls, my mom will talk with me two minutes. I'll talk with her 10 minutes. Loves her so much. She's been a blessing to the family. There's no, 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 no. She, she's just been a blessing to the entire family. You want someone that's going to be a blessing to your life. Marriage is a reward from the father. Don't pick a wife or a, or a husband from online dating agency. Don't get a wife or a, or a husband from the recommendation of maybe your parents, your friends, your colleagues. Let God give you. He's the one that has created everybody. He knows who is best for you. And when you depend upon him, he will give that to you. Good marriages are never a result of trial and error. You know, sampling every person in town. You know, some people, they'll go out and say, okay, let's go out for six months. Let's know ourselves. Let's see whether we are compatible. You will never know whether you are compatible with anybody until people can fake it. If somebody wants to marry you, he can pretend. He knows what you like. And he can show you that side. And you say, ah, this one is right. When the person now gets into the house, shows you her true color, shows you his true color. Say trial and error, we go out, and when we go to eat, I'll be observing her. She, this and that. That's not the way to get married. A good wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is from the Lord. That's what you have read. A good wife or a godly husband is from the Lord. Let God lead you. Know all these brothers that when you come to church, you are not married. Sunday morning, as the sisters are coming, instead of praying and preparing your heart and saying, God, you are going to bless me today. You are evaluating statistics of the sisters and the clothes they wear. Every one of them as they are coming. Are you in church? You can't get married that way, my brother. You will fall into a, a, you know, a bad marriage. You want to evaluate with physical appearance. I like the way she talks. I like the way she moves. I like the way she dresses. She's very cultured. Is that the basis of marriage? Don't you know that there are cultured devils? Very cultured, but they are worse than serpents. You need to sit down and be sober and know that the way to good marriage, marriage is God's idea. Marriage is God's institution. And God can give you the best if you depend upon him. A good marriage is from the Lord. Let me show you for people that want to not, don't, you don't want to depend upon God. You don't want to obtain favor from God. Let me show you what happens. Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. I want you to open. Proverbs 23, verse 27. For a whore is a deep ditch, a prostitute. Is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lies in wait as for a prey. What does she do? She increases transgressors among men. When you fall into that kind of a trap, you become a bigger sinner. Your life is going to be warped. But let me ask you, what kind of men fall into this? Because this passage doesn't tell you. But look at chapter 22, verse 14. Chapter 22, verse 14. He's talking about a whore. He's talking about a strange woman. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 14. The mouth of strange women is what? A deep, a deep pit. It's a deep pit. 
He that is abhorred of the Lord, what will happen? Shall fall the enemy. So is it that you obtain favor from God or you are abhorred by God? When you obtain favor from God, gives you a prudent wife, gives you a wonderful wife. When you are not in favor with God and God abhors you, you fall into that deep ditch. The mouth of a strange woman, of strange woman is a deep ditch. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall there. That's how some people don't fall into those kind of marriages that you know, their lives are just wiped out. From the day they get into that relationship, peace disappears. Progress disappears. Their life is upside down, turbulent. And then they say, how did I get into this mess? Are you in favor with God? Or are you abhorred by God as a sinner? And God allowed you you just fall into whatever you want to fall into. A strange woman, a whore, is a deep ditch. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. I pray you will not fall into a bad relationship. Amen. You will not fall into a deep ditch. Amen. This series is meant to help you in that respect, not to fall into a deep ditch. You know, there was a brother like that. Even when I remember up to today, my heart is pain. Was coming to church. Very faithful brother. And before you know it, he fell into a deep ditch. Fell into you know, the hands of a woman. A woman already had five children. Even the firstborn of the woman is almost as old as this particular brother. And from that moment, we can't see the brother. His life was turned upside down. From who he used to be, he became somebody else. Manipulated. His life, even himself cannot even get benefit from his life anymore. I pray you will not fall into a deep ditch. Amen. To fall into a deep ditch is to be destroyed, is to be wiped out. But the Bible says it is the person that is abroad of the Lord that falls into that. When you have favor, God will shield you from that kind of a thing. So you need to understand that marriage, for you to work, you need to work with God. For marriage to work, you need to have a relationship with the Father. For marriage to work, you need to be a responsible adult and a faithful adult. And then God, as a reward for your faithfulness, as a reward for your responsibility, as a reward for your relationship with him, can now lead you into, can settle you in a good home. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. Look at it in, in Psalm, 60, Psalm 68, as I finish, Psalm 68. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to help you. He wants to set you in a family. You are alone. God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him and help me. I will set to him in a family. Psalm 60, 68 verse 6. God set the solitary in families. Are you single and you want to settle down in a fulfilling marriage? God set the solitary in families. Let God set you in a fulfilling family. Don't help yourself. Don't try corner corner kind of a ways. Be straightforward. Let God set you in families. But you know what the Bible says? He bring get out those which are bound with chains. But the rebellious, they dwell in the ground. No help. No water. No refreshing. The rebellious, they dwell in the dry ground. God wants to set you in family. God wants to give you a fulfilling home. And I'm praying that this series is going to help all our brethren that are not married. 
that in years to come, we'll be able to say, thank God for that series. It opened my eyes. It helped me to do things in the right way. And now I'm enjoying it. I pray that this series, the insight and the information that we'll be receiving, even for those, maybe you made a mistake, you're already married, nobody's telling you to send away your wife or to tell your husband to pack. Maybe you are not doing things right. The information and the insight you'll be receiving, when you begin to implement it, things will surely improve. Amen. And your family will Amen. be able to be what God wants it to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For those maybe your husband is not here, encourage them to be on the series. For those whose wives are not here, encourage them to be in the series so that what you are hearing, they are hearing. And then when you meet together, you'll be able to see how to implement things and take things forward. It's important because if one day you hear and the other party doesn't hear, the other party doesn't, when you are speaking, you are speaking Greek, the other person doesn't understand you. Well, it's coming from a background of complete ignorance. So how, how does he or she, how, how do they understand you? They can't. So if you can, encourage them to be on this series. And we'll talk about the singles, we'll talk about people who are married, how your marriage should be, what you should be doing and go. I pray that these next two months are going to be you know, two months of uh, real uh, marriage enrichment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we finish today, effective preparation for marriage. This is part one. Next week, I'll give you three more points from that same Genesis chapter two and we'll begin to move on. So number one, relationship with the father. Are you born again? If God is going to help you, if God is going to give you a wife, if God is going to give you a husband, a good wife, a godly husband is from the Lord. If that God is going to help you to find one, to give you one, you need to have a relationship with him. If you don't, if you, if you, have, if you have not, today is an opportunity for you to be born again. And then, have you grown up? Are you an adult? What makes us adults is not our age. Somebody can be 45 and is still a baby. It's not your age that makes you to be an adult. By the time I was 18, I was more than an adult. I was taking care of my junior ones already at 18. Responsible enough. When they give me some money, you know most people at 18, if they give you money, you go and use it to buy puff puff and some things to eat. Even at 18, when they give me money, I can use it to buy textbook for my junior ones. I was already that matured, trying to build a future for us because we had a dad that couldn't care less. <laughs> if our life is going to go forward, we've got to take responsibility for us. I grew up fast. At 18, I was already a man, a proper adult. But there are some people, they are 42. They are still babies. So it's not your age. So don't come and say, Pastor, you see, I'm an adult. What makes me to see whether you are an adult is to see whether you are responsible, is to see whether you are independent, is to see whether you are faithful, is to see whether you reason and act like an adult, not like the children that are playing, not like children that are playing with toys in the nursery. That's what makes you an adult. So somebody is 21 is an adult. And that person is 33 and is a baby. Are you faithful? Are you responsible? Are you independent? And remember, marriage is not for boys and girls. Marriage is for men and women. When you get married, sometimes it depends on the constitution of the woman. There are women that once they take in and they get pregnant, they are just, you know, their system is irritated and the woman will just be, you know, saliva, just spitting every time. And sometimes the woman just puts a cup after five minutes. And some men will say, ah, what, is the, what is the problem now? A man that is a, a boy, you should know that that can happen to a woman. You need to support her, not to be asking her, what is wrong? All this spit, spit, spit. That's our constitution. That's part of it. Say, but uh, when I married you, I didn't know you were like this. How will you know she's like that? She was not pregnant. 
This is what happens to pregnant women. But you should be prepared for that. You know, as some men don't understand. When you see somebody who is not an adult, your wife gives back to one child and gives back to the second child and gives back to the third child. And after every child, the woman is putting on weight. And now the woman, after three children, I said, when I married you, you were very slim and uh, you know, you were just like this perfect figure. But look at the way you are today. My brother, who, who, who made her that way? You are putting her in the family where you don't know that she's going to be gaining weight. You don't know that her shape is going to change. My brother, grow up. Be an adult. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is all what it entails. To know that that woman will not be like the 22 figure that you met 15 years ago. She's giving back. Her shape will change. Amen? Amen. Amen. I pray that the Lord is going to open our eyes and make us to come back to earth because some of us are living in cloud nine. Our ideas of our marriage is completely off the charts. We are not realistic, but God is bringing us back to realism, showing us what can work. And as we go on from next week, more and more, as we get more insight, I pray that it's going to be a glorious journey in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's rise up and pray. Let's rise up and pray and tell the Lord that the Lord will help us. That the Lord will help us. That this series is going to be a glorious series enriching our lives, enriching our marriages, enriching every area that marriages are going to get better. People who are not married, by the time they get married, they will get married in a beautiful, wonderful way. God will settle them down because it's the one that sets the solitary in families. And God will settle them in glorious families. The Lord himself will do it. Begin to pray, my brother. Begin to pray, my sister. And tell the Lord. And if you are not born again, you don't have a relationship with the Father. This is your opportunity of starting a relationship with the Father. You born again. Otherwise, God cannot help you. You need to be a child of God. You need to take responsibility for your future and for your marriage. Heavenly Father, as we start this journey, we're inviting you to come along with us. Amen. Change our mentality. Amen. Amen. Help us to know that you are very much interested in all settling down in a good family. Amen. Amen. That you set the solitary in families. You set two people and make them to be comfortable and their marriages to be enriching and fulfilling. You do it. But you do it only for people who belong to you. For people who trust you. For people who are not trying to be crafty and working their way. But for people that say, Lord, I just yield unto you. You know the best for me. You know the best man for my life. You know the best woman for my life. Oh God, I just surrender everything. Oh Lord, I pray that your children will not will be able to completely trust you knowing that you will give them the very best in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I've seen that a good wife is from the Lord. That somebody that gets a good wife or gets a godly husband is obtaining favor from God. But when somebody is out of favor from God, out of favor with God, God can allow him to fall into the deep ditch that will finish him and wipe him out. Oh Lord, I pray that none of our sisters, none of our brothers will fall into a deep ditch in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Order their steps Amen. to a good and fulfilling marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bring them partners that will be a, a mighty benefit for their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, I'm praying that for those who are already married, when we go beyond talking to singles and we start talking to those who are already married, 
that the principles they're going to get from this series, as they begin to put them into practice in their marriages, all the kind of friction and all the kind of things that are not working, they will begin to work in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Things around in their marriage. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because I know you've answered. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen.